so I think uh, shall we start yes let's begin sure Uh, very good morning to all the history enthusiasts who have joined us today. Continue. A very warm good morning to all the history enthusiasts who have joined us today in this inaugural session of the Itihasa Saptaha 3.0. Uh, international webinar on rewriting her story organized by the History Enthusiasts Association, Hubli, Karnataka, India, on the occasion of uh, uh, the association's third anniversary. Uh, I am Ms. Nidhi Kati, Vice President of the History Enthusiasts, and I will be the moderator of this session today. Uh, let's begin the session with the blessings of Bharat Mata. I request Ms. Bhargavi Kati, Executive Member, the History Enthusiasts Association, to sing the National Song of India. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Vande Mataram Vande Mataram Vande Mataram Vande Mataram Sojalam Sufalam Malaya Jashitaram Shasya Shamalam Mataram Vande Mataram Shubra Jotnam Pulakitayamini Pulakusumita Drumatara Shopini Suhasini Sumadhura Bhashini Sukhadam Varadam Mataram Vande Mataram Thank you. Very nice. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bhargavi Kati. <coughs> Moving on, uh, I now request Ms. Duty and Ms. Nigdha Jagirdar, Hindustani classical vocalists, to perform the invocation song and give this morning a melodious beginning. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Nidhi Kati. Uh, good morning, everybody. We'll be presenting uh, a song on uh, Ma Saraswati. Gadilamati Saraswati, Kodu Begadilamati, Kodu Begadilamati Saraswati, Kodu Begadilamati, Brida Hari Haya Mukha, Rodi Ali. Ruda Hari Haya Mukha, Rodi Ali Nilaya, Hadi Gadi Dera Gove, Amma Brahma Narani, Kodu Bega Dilya Mati, Saraswati, Kodu Bega Dilya Mati, Akhila Vidya Bhimani, Ajana Patta Darani, Akhila Vidya Bhimani, Ajana Patta Darani, Sukha Vittu Pali Se, Shujana Shiro Mani, Kodu Vedar Dilya Mati, 
सरस्वती पूर्वे गति पतित पावने गति नंबी पतित पावने गति नंबी सतत पुरंदर विठलन तो Thank you both for the amazing performance, Duti and Snigda. Uh, I would now like to officially welcome the virtual gathering uh, on behalf of myself and the entire team of the history enthusiasts. Uh, I welcome Professor R. P. Goldman, uh, Professor of Sanskrit uh, Emeritus, and Professor in the Graduate School Department of South. and southeast asian studies university of california berkeley uh, ca usa who has joined us today as the inaugural speaker welcome sir i warmly welcome you sir thank you so much yes continue thank you sir i also warmly welcome our keynote speaker professor <laughs> samresh bandopadhyay principal advisor North American Institute for Oriental and Classical Studies USA and former professor and head department of ancient indian history and culture university of kolkata uh, my heartiest welcome to shri nandan shastri uh, our beloved honorary president of the history enthusiast freelance museum consultant and the president of this session I also welcome all senior advisory board members of the history enthusiasts all our beloved resource persons of various upcoming sessions scholars and students from different parts of the country and the world last but not the least i welcome ms manali mumaya president of the history enthusiasts association and all executive committee members of our association I now request Ms. Manali Mumaya to give the introductory remarks and also briefly introduce our valuable guests. Thank you so much, Nidhi, for the warm welcome. Uh, I hope I am audible to everyone. Uh, so uh, this is this is the first time we are having such a huge um, endeavor, academic endeavor, a webinar. and uh, that is on the occasion of the third anniversary of the history enthusiasts exactly 3 years ago on this day i and my friend nidhi came up with the idea of establishing this uh, a small group of scholars we had um, we had not expected that we will come this far and uh, we will be doing so much and that we will uh be celebrating the third anniversary today with professor goldman and uh, anandan shastri sir and professor bandopadhyay and all these wonderful scholars from across the world uh so uh, it is overwhelming and uh, absolutely um, a dream it's like a dream uh, a few words about the uh, history enthusiasts we started on 13th may 2020 it was just a small idea uh the times uh it was during the uh, covid period and uh, i think the world was on lockdown at that time uh i and nidhi we had uh, been corresponding just a second so yeah so uh, myself and nidhi we always uh, communicated with each other and uh, we were thinking that even during these times of lockdown we need some sorts of uh, knowledge we need somewhere uh, to learn uh, since the colleges and universities everything was locked down so um, nidhi suggested that let's start a facebook page and uh, uh, let's organize some online lectures and see where it goes and um, it was actually also in my mind so um, i completely uh, immediately agreed to her 
and after that we on immediately on the same day we started the facebook page and uh, slowly we started the youtube channel and then we created the whatsapp group and uh, very uh, fortunately uh, the support that everybody showed us our elders our professors our teachers uh, friends everyone they were so supportive that today we have uh, become a registered association and uh, we have signed an mou uh, with the vivekananda autonomous college of kolhapur uh, we have successfully uh, organized over 50 online lectures uh, three offline events um, several book reviews uh, panel discussions on burning topics and a lot of other things uh, we are also planning to uh, participate or volunteer in uh, uh, heritage uh, um, conservation uh, activities on field so uh, i think all this was only possible because of the uh, support that our elders showed us i do have to acknowledge uh, the role of uh, Sri Nandan Shastri sir, our honorary president. Uh, he has been a great guiding source for us um, ever since the beginning. So uh, he and then uh, we have Professor Ravi Kori Shetar sir, Professor Shiladar Mughli sir, uh, who are there from the beginning with us. And then uh, there is a saying in Hindi, "Log jude gaye, karva banta gaya." So uh, that's our story exactly. Uh, people started joining us. We have so many scholars. I cannot, uh, I apologize because I cannot take everybody's name here. But uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful journey of three years. And uh, uh, we are going to continue for much, much longer with your support. Uh, that is just a little bit of introduction about the History Enthusiasts Association. We are based in uh, Hubbali. Uh, it is a uh, the commercial capital of North Karnataka. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, a very historical uh, town, and uh, we uh, we are having reach all across Karnataka and now India, and we hope to have uh, in, uh, increase our reach worldwide. So, uh, with those introductory remarks, uh, I would now like to introduce our today's inaugural speaker, uh, Professor R. P. Goldman, sir. Uh, Professor Robert Goldman is the William and Catherine Magistrati Distinguished Professor of Sanskrit and India Studies. He got his bachelor's degree from Columbia College in 1964 and completed his doctoral studies at the University of Pennsylvania in 1971. Uh, he has taught and held uh, fellowships at several academic institutions around the world, uh, including the University of Rochester, Oxford University, Jadavpur University, and Jawaharlal Nehru University. His areas of scholarly interest include Sanskrit literature and literary theory, Indian epic studies, and psychoanalytically uh, oriented cultural studies. He has published widely in these areas, authoring several books and dozens of scholarly articles. He is perhaps best known for his work as the director, general editor, and principal translator of a massive and fully annotated Princeton University uh, press translation of the critical edition of the Valmiki Ramayana perhaps the single most widely copied and massively influential text on the religions, literatures, societies, politics, and general cultures of the entire region of South and Southeast Asia, from antiquity to the modern world. The Los Angeles Times book review included his work, uh, translated, annotated, and edited, along with Professor uh, Sally J. Sutherland Goldman, uh, Sir's wife, uh, titled The Ramayana of Valmiki, An Epic of Ancient India, Volume 5, Sundar Kanda. Uh, so this book was uh, included in the Los Angeles Times Book Review's list of the 100 best books of 1997. His work has been recognized by several awards, fellowships, and prizes, including election as a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, in 1966, a citation and award for distinguished fellowship at Calcutta Sanskrit College in 1992. Oh, sorry, uh, the citation and award for distinguished teaching at the University of California at Berkeley, uh, 1974. Honorary fellowship at Calcutta Sanskrit College, 1992. Honorary degree of Vidya Sagar, uh, which means Ocean of Learning, uh, by the Mandakini Sanskrit Vidwat Parishad, New Delhi, uh, in 97. President certificate that is from the uh, uh, Honorable President of India uh, for Sanskrit. Uh, it's an international award, uh, which was given in 2013. Excellence in Teaching Award presented by the Phi Beta Kappa 
uh, Northern California Association in 2016, the World Sanskrit Award. Uh, in 2017, which was presented by the Indian Council for Cultural Relations and the A.K. Ramanujan Translation Prize by the Association of Asian Studies, uh, along with uh, Professor Sally Sutherland Goldman in 2020. A fetch script uh, entitled Epic and Argument in Sanskrit Literary History, Essays in Honor of Professor R.P. Goldman, edited by another renowned scholar of Sanskrit, that is Professor Sheldon Pollock, uh, was published in 2010. It is an honor to have such a distinguished and valuable scholar with us today on this occasion. Uh, once again, sir, I welcome you. Uh, now, I briefly, uh, I move on to the introduction of uh, Professor Samresh Bandopadhyay, sir, who will be joining us shortly. Born in 1942 in an illustrious family famous for scholarship, patriotism, and philanthropic activities, uh, Professor Dr. Bandopadhyay, a brilliant student of the University of Calcutta, is the recipient of several scholarships, uh, research fellowships, and a gold medal for ranking first class in BA honors uh, in ancient Indian history and culture. He served his alma mater for over four decades uh, in different capacities and retired in 2007 as a professor. He has to his credit 10 books, 25 edited works, and nearly 300 research articles published in Indian and foreign journals. Well worthy of mention are uh, Acharya Vandana, uh, D.R. Bhandarkar Birth Centenary Volume, that is, uh, edited by him, released in 1985 by the then Prime Minister of India, Srimati Indira Gandhi, and commended as one of the best Indological publications of the century and the best of the type by Sir Harold Bailey of Cambridge University, UK. Thoughts on Synthesis of Science and Religion, also edited by him, uh, along with Dr. T.D. Singh of Berkeley University, incorporates contributions uh, from as many as five Nobel laureates. Bha uh, Bharata Samskriti presentations at the three-day international seminar on importance of early Indian culture in making a better world, published from the USA in 2015. He became the general president of the Numismatic Society of India in 2002, uh, general president of Epigraphical Society of India uh, in 2003, and the general president of Indian Art History Congress in 2012. His invaluable contributions to the study of history of science has earned him the Nelson Wright Medal of the Numismatic Society of India, from uh, that is in Varanasi, uh, the Honorary Fellowship of Ancient Sciences and Archaeological Society of uh, India, Mysore, uh, and the highest award, Jnanandidhi, of the government-sponsored Academy of Sanskrit Research, uh, Melu Kote, Karnataka. He was honored with the Sir Acharya J.C. Bose Memorial Award in 2015, uh, uh, sorry, for 2015 in January 2016 at the Bose Institute main campus, Kolkata, for his outstanding uh, contribution to the History uh, Institute uh, for the History of Science and uh, Archaeology. Associated in different capacities with different learned uh, institutions of different parts of India and foreign countries, Professor Bandopadhyay is now a fellow of the Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain and Ireland, a member of the advisory board of Sthapatyam, a journal of the Indian science of architecture and allied sciences, published from Delhi, and the principal advisor of North American Institute of Oriental and Classical Studies, USA, which promotes worldwide the study of the history of science. In honor of Professor Bandopadhyay, uh, two felicitation volumes have been uh, edited uh, by a great Indologist of present times, Professor Ian Mabbitt of Australia, and uh, uh, in September last year, he was honored by the prestigious award of Diploma of Honor by the oldest university in the Western Hemisphere, San Marcos University, uh, Lima, Peru, uh, that is South America. Uh, the diploma specifically recognizes his outstanding contribution to the field of education in general, and specifically promotion of early Indian cultural studies, traditions, and heritage. Uh, Thank you. That was the introduction of uh, uh, Professor uh, Bandopadhyay. Very briefly, I will also like to introduce our uh, honorary president, Sri Nandan sir. Uh, he completed his BSc with geology majors from Gujarat University MSc in uh, geology and postgraduate diploma in museum studies, uh, both from Maharaja Sayadirav University of Baroda. Having over 43 years of experience in the field of museology with focus on environmental sciences and specialization in earth science, uh, Sir has proficiency in treating of 
uh, treatment of corroded historical objects, geological aspects of archaeological excavations and exploration. He has to his credit over 145 articles uh, published at national and international uh, level, journals and magazines related to topics on museum marketing, new museology, display techniques of artifacts and so on. Starting his career as a scientific assistant at the Museum of Applied Geology, Indian School of Mines, Dhanbad, uh, he went on to serve as a curator at various notable museums in India, including the University uh, Museum, Wallab Vidyanagar, uh, the Samrat Samprati Museum, Koba. Uh, he also served as curator cum museologist at Sardar uh, Wallabhai Patel National Memorial Museum for uh, the most part of his career. Uh, that is in Ahmedabad, and also as visiting faculty at Vikram A. Sarabhai Community Science Association of India for four years, uh, and executive committee member. He was also the executive committee member of uh, ICOM's uh, uh, Indian Natural Committee for two tenures. At USA, he volunteered at various museums, including the American Museum of Natural History, New York, Mayburn Museum, uh, Baylor University, Texas, uh, Temecula Valley Museum, uh, California, Art, uh, Asian Art Museum, San Francisco, California Academy of Sciences, San Francisco, and the Lawrence Hall of Science, University of California, Berkeley. He has published a book in Gujarati language on museums in India, uh, which is published by University Book Production Board, Government of Gujarat, Gandhinagar, India. Uh, with these few uh, words of introduction, I now hand over to Nidhi. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Manali. Uh, I now request Professor Goldman to deliver the inaugural address. Thank you, President uh, Momaya, Vice President Nidikati, Professor Bandopadhyay, and my old friend uh, Nandan Shastri. Uh, it's a very great pleasure for me to be with you uh, this morning, as it is on your side. Um, since the uh, history enthusiasts this time seem to emphasize this notion of her story rather than his story, I thought I would talk a little bit about some aspects of gender in the great Sanskrit epics, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana of Valmiki. And it's important that one knows these texts because they are the most influential texts, I believe, written in India in the ancient period and have long traditions of echoing through the centuries and the millennia. And they're very important in, um, thank you, uh, important, you can put up uh, uh, number one. Um, they're very important uh, in the formation and dissemination of many deep cultural formations in South Asia regarding gender, hierarchy, difference, and conduct. So let me talk a little bit about the way women have been represented in these uh, seminal texts. Well, as most of you know, there's a kind of uh, ambivalence in these texts, which were largely composed by men, uh, of women as on the one hand, seductresses, sexually charged who seduce men, who seduce sages like the Apsarasas and so on, and rob them of their ascetic powers. On the other hand, women are often elevated to uh, paragons of purity uh, and uh, innocence and so on, and can be treated in very different ways in the epic. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the way violence figures in these representations. Now, as you must know, violence against women forms a very central narrative feature of both epics. That is to say, in the Ramayana, it's the abduction of Sita, of course, and her abuse at the hands of uh, the monstrous sexual predator, actually, Ravana. And in the Mahabharata, there is at the center the marvelous character of the long-suffering, much-abused character of Draupadi, who is not only famously humiliated in the Sabha, of the Kaurava court, 
by the attempt at least to, to uh, disrobe her, this uh, Vastraharana. Uh, but also, uh, as we'll see as I go along, subjected, since the authors seem to want to harp on this theme, to numerous attacks and assaults on the behalf of men. Um, um, Manali, can you show the uh, slideshow from here so we can look through them? Thank you. All right, so this is the one I just wanted to show opening up. This is actually a, a poster art, you know, a uh, painting of uh, Bhima and uh, Hidimba, famous scene from the uh, Mahabharata, in which you see the Rak uh, Rakshasi, uh, who often are regarded as hypersexualized, as uh, in a sense, seducing Bhima, who actually sort of marries her, you might say, without benefit of clergy. And uh, they actually produce that half human, half monstrous uh, child who becomes important in the Mahabharata story, Ghatotkacha. So let me read a little bit of this. One of the most central elements that run deeply through the Ramayana and the Mahabharata is that of sexual violence, including abduction and rape perpetrated against women. Let me begin to ana analyze the centrality and prevalence of this theme and its significance in these seminal texts. Let me try to classify the types of gendered violence that occupy so prominent a place in the epic and related Puranic corpus, highlighting specific cases and their consequences. We must differentiate between what the textual tradition regards as what I would call licit and illicit forms of sexual assault and the ways in which the intimately related issue of the performance of masculinity and femininity with their attendant anxieties are represented. By licit, I mean the shastraically sanctioned form of kshatriya marriage, known as the rakshasa vivaha, which involves the abduction of the bride, whether willing or not, and the wreaking of extreme violence on the males of her natal family. You can read this in the uh, Manusmriti, you know, bitwa, hatwa, chitwa, cutting, breaking, and so on. They drag the wailing woman from the house. But this is the, a normative form of marriage sanctioned by the Shastras, but specifically for Kshatriyas. It's a warrior form of marriage. And we see it several times in the epics and in the Puranas, of course, as in the uh, example of uh, Bhishma's abduction of the daughters of the Kashiraja and Krishna's abduction of Rukmini. In one case, there was a non-consensual abductions. In the case of Rukmini, it's a consensual abduction. So there are very subtle uh, differences. This occurs not unfrequently in the epics and Puranas as considered thoroughly legitimate form of marriage, which serves to establish legitimate lines of royal succession. Episodes of illicit gender violence, however, are equally, if not more frequent in the epic literature and generally have important consequences for the offender and the direction of the narrative. These include accounts of adultery, rape, abduction of a married woman, and even voyeurism. Almost always such violations result to minor mutilation, either symbolic or disabling, to violent death. All of these episodes are intended as cautionary tales and speak to a specific anxiety about the loss of manhood through fear of actual or symbolic emasculation. Indeed, punitive emasculation, you might say, literal, uh, is, it haunts the imagination of the epic poets. And if you look at, for example, Manusmriti 887, the, the punishment for rape is mutilation, right? That uh, whatever man should assault a young woman in his arrogance should receive the punishment of the amputation of two fingers and a fine of 600. I think I'll begin with a narrative that I consider the locus classicus of sexual crime and punishment one which is widely replicated throughout the literature, the tale of the encounter of Indra and Ahalya. The story is recounted twice in the Ramayana alone, in the poems Bala and Uttarakhandas, respect, respectively. The first is best known. It's a tale of seduction, adultery, and reprisal in which the notorious philanderer Indra, taking on the guise of the sage Gautama, 
approaches his wife Ahalia in order to have illicit adulterous relations with her. Although this is clearly an attempt to trick a virtuous wife. You can have the second slide, please, Manali. Manali, can you get the second slide up? Yes, this is these are modern paintings. So here you see uh, in this particular slide, uh, Indra, who has assumed the guise of Ahalya, trying to slink away from their little ashram hut on the, on the return of the genuine uh, Gautama. Next slide. So the punishment for you see, this is from uh, the uh, um, mid 17th century, very beautifully illustrated Ramayana uh, called the uh, Mewar Ramayana, in which you see, uh, it's a little bit graphic, I'm afraid, the actual punishment that is the result of this, of this illicit uh, seduction is the uh, castration of Indra and the replacement of the lost organs by those of a ram that was sacrificed. So this is a again again a very literal kind of punishment. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So, and the first account of this is interesting because it's clearly an attempt to trick a virtuous wife into having relations with a male other than her husband. But Valmiki's account of the effort is curiously nuanced in that he makes it clear that Ahalya is complicit in this deed. Uh, he says is Muni Vesham Sahasraksham Vinaya Ragunandana Matim Chakara Durmeda Deva Raja Kutuhalat. She made up her mind, right? That evil minded woman out of the desire for the God. Deva Raja Kutuhalat, for the desire or curiosity for the uh, king of the gods, that is uh, Indra. Here's a, just a, a modern painting. And uh, the punishment, um, of course, was this castration. And again, what we often see is in other texts is the punishment is the marking of Indra's body with a thousand replicas of the female generative organ. So again, it's a form of symbolic castration. But when he pleads uh, not to be so humiliated, there's a gift, a remission, that you can turn those uh, organs into eyes that you see here in this particular slide. And this is why you see the uh, common epithet of Indra as Sahasraksha Indra thousand-eyed Indra, but it's a kind of embarrassing story for him, right? Through the power of the curse, the god is actually literally castrated, leaving him to plead with the gods to make good this loss through an early instance of transplant surgery. In doing so, he recasts his adultery as a mission on behalf of the gods. And why is that? Because this is, because by forcing Gautama to curse him, Gautama is therefore also finds the diminishment of his ascetic power. So it's often the intention of these women or others to either lure uh, a, a rishi or a celibate into having sexual intercourse with a, an attendant loss of sexual and ascetic power, or to have him curse you, which accomplishes the same thing. An example would be in the uh, Ramayana, that long story of Vishwamitra, where you see the uh, as seduction of uh, Vishwamitra by Menaka on the one hand, which a loss of his power, and then the attempt of the seduction by Ra uh, Rambha, which, whom he curses with an a accompanying loss of power. So there's this kind of theme that keeps percolating through these texts, right? And that's why he then makes his adultery into a benefit for the gods, because the gods fear these sages because of their enormous power. Um, 
So this is an unusual, but also the first source of this story. Uh, and you see then the consequences of it. The second narration of the Ahalya Indra story in the Ramayana occurs in the Uttarakanda at uh, Saga 7, where uh, that is Arkanda 730, where Brahma tells it to the forgetful Indra himself, who is despondent at having been defeated and imprisoned by Indrajita. Here there is no hint of complicity or consent, because what is this a punishment for the rape of Ahalya with no consensual performance on her part? a straight story of rape, and for this transgression, Gautama curses the once powerful king of the gods, not only to suffer the impotence of defeat and captivity at the hands of Indrajit, and that's why he gets the name Indrajit, of course, the conqueror of Indra, but to lose his tenure as the king of the gods. In addition, and this is interesting, one half of the guilt which would be incurred by every future rapist in history would accrue to Indra, who's the originator of that crime. Here, Ahalya is not complicit, but she receives the same punishment as in the other versions of the classic theme, according to the common, all too common theme of blame the victims for her unfortunate problems. Aside from the various stories of, Ahal of Indra and Ahalya, Epics are conspicuously marked by the numerous accounts of assault and abduction perpetrated on women, especially the here heroines. The most prominent, dramatic, and emotionally wrenching of these are the brutal sexual assault on Draupadi in the Mahabharata Sabha Parvan and the violent abduction of Sita in the Ramayana Saranyakanda. Both women are seized violently by their hair, which is a very important kind of symbol of, of sexual assault, Kesha Grahana, as they call it seizing a woman by her hair. Remember, both are attacked in this way. Draupadi is subjected to vile taunting and almost humiliatingly, her abuser exposes his left thigh, a barely surrogate, displaced surrogate for his genitalia to her. And Dushasana attempts to strip her during the period, her period before the all male assembly. This all takes place while her husbands now impotent and helpless to defend her must look on in futile rage. You can give the next slide, please. This is the, the uh, other punishment of Indra. You can see uh, the battle taking place with the gods against the uh, Rakshasas. And in the bottom low left panel, you can see Indra being led away in captivity with his hands tied behind his back. And there on the lower right panel, he's in prison in the palace of Ravana until Brahma intercedes and releases him. Next slide, please. This is of course a uh, poster art, uh, the Draupadi uh, Chiraharana it's called here, but there you see Krishna rescuing Draupadi from the humiliation of being stripped by Dushasana there while her husbands sit there uh, impotent and furious, but unable to do anything because they've lost themselves and lost her. That's another key issue that you can see that a husband is considered to be able to stake his wife in a bet as a piece of his property. Such an extreme sexual violation cannot go unpunished in the world of the epic, and both Draupadi and the Pandavas through Bhima will have their revenge. Bhima, enraged at her overtly, Duryodhana's overtly sexual assault, vows to smash his thigh as a fitting punishment, again, a mutilation, uh, even though it violates the rules of mace combat for Kshatriyas, and perhaps as requital for the displaying of Draupadi while in her period, he makes this ghastly vow to drink Dushasana's blood. At the end of the now inevitable war between the Kaurava factions, he will fulfill those two dreadful vows. It's not hard to see that these acts are in keeping with the theme of mutilation as punishment that we saw in the cases of uh, Indra and uh, uh, the other figures. For the crushing of the thighs is amount to a thinly disguised emasculation of Duryodhana, reading this in a sense, kind of psychologically, or the drinking of the blood resonates with the violation of the menstrual seclusion of uh, Theropathy. 
as dramatic and horrifying as all this is and how it determinative will be for the course of the epic narrative, the author or authors of the Mahabharata are not done with the theme and not done with the suffering of poor Draupadi. They seem intent on over-determining this theme by subjecting Draupadi to two further such attacks, one in each of the poems following two books, the Aranyaka and Virata Parvans. In the former, the Pandavas and Draupadi seek anonymity in the kingdom of Virata, where each of them secures employment at the court. Uh, next slide, please. Draupadi, having avoided becoming a domestic servant at Hastinapur, and now takes up the same role as a Sairandri, or female domestic help for the Queen Sudeshana. Her beauty attracts the attention of the Queen's lecherous brother Kichika. Infatuated, he proposes to marry her, but is rejected. His sister, the Queen, sends her to him with some drinks, and in what must be one of the world literature's first portrayal of workplace harassment, he begins to fondle her. When she withdraws to the Sabha, he pursues her and as earlier seizes her by the hair, another Kesha Grahana, throws her to the floor and kicks her. Her husbands, once again, impotent, cannot intervene without betraying their identities. Draupadi then seeks out Bhima to tell him of her troubles and uh, Bhima tells her to make a nocturnal assignation with Kichika in a deserted pal pavilion where he will take her place. And there ensues a grimly comical scene in which Kichika, thinking Bhima is Draupadi, in the darkness begins to caress him. Bhima then seizes him by the hair. Again, notice that element that keeps being repeated. The same act of subordination, and after a brief struggle, crushes him and forces all his limbs, including his head, into his body in a ghastly and heavily overdetermined uh, excision, as it were, of all of his limbs. Draupadi's abuser is reduced to an indistinguishable lump of flesh. Now, one might think that after this, poor Draupadi had suffered enough. Next slide, please. But evidently, the epic poets did not think so. After her troubles in the court of the Matsyas, she is forced to undergo a sexually motivated abduction at the hands of Jayadrata. This is again, uh, sorry, this again is uh, Kichika proposing to or attempting to seduce uh, Draupadi in her guise as a domestic help. Next slide, please. The episode is very similar. Uh, it's again, you see Sudeshna sending, uh, uh, she's assuring her, he won't hurt you, right? Since I sent you there. And that of course proves to be uh, false. Next slide, please. She's forced to undergo an, another abduction at the hands of, uh, She's carrying the wine here to her. Next slide. I'm going to move along a little. The episode is rather similar to the one involving Sita's abduction. This is Jayadratta abducting Draupadi the minute she's left alone by her husbands who've gone off on a hunting trip. This episode is similar to the one involving Sita's abduction by Ravana, including the heroines being left unprotected in the forest while her protectors are off hunting. You'll remember that's the scene in the Ramayana. The sexual infatuation of the assailant, the proposal of marriage, the debate between the abductor and the victim and the abduction itself. When the Pandavas learn what has happened, they pursue Jayadrata and his entourage, slaughtering his army and capturing the culprit. Bhima, ever the champion of Draupadi, seizes Jayadrata by the hair. Again, always the hair which is a, a powerful symbol, throws him to the ground, kicks him in the head, prevented by Yudhishthira and Arjuna from actually killing Jayadrata, who's a kinsman. Bhima contents himself with partially shaving his head, leaving only five tufts of hair. This too, especially because of the powerful confection of hair of both men and women as markers of sexuality, can be seen as an upward displacement of a kind of castration, a loss of manhood that is tantamount to death. Compare a passage in the Bhagavata Purana, where after defeating the army of Rukmin, who has attempted to stop his consensual abduction of Rukmini, Krishna refrains from killing his pursuer in deference to the pleas of his abductee, because it's her brother after all. Instead, he must content himself with shaving Rukmin's head and mustache. 
but as elsewhere, this is considered disgraceful and even tantamount to death. Asavidam Tvaya Krishna Kritam Masma Jugupsitam Vapanam Smashrakeshanam Vairupyam Surdo Vada. What you have done, Krishna, is a disgrace, which I find repellent. The disfigurement of shaving an ally's beard and hair is a form of death. After discussing the Mahabharata's accounts of these three sexual assaults, let me turn to the Ramayana. Valmiki, like Vyasa, is not content with a single outrage against his heroine. However, rather than reprise the assaults on the heroine, as does Vyasa in the books following the Sabah Parvan, Valmiki foreshadows Sita's abduction near the very beginning of the book in which she is later taken by Ravana. As Rama and Lakshmana and Sita enter the Dandaka forest, they are confronted by an almost absurdly grotesque and monstrous forest rakshasa, Virada. In a bizarre sexual assault, the monster quickly seizes the terrified Sita in his gigantic arms, announcing that she shall be his wife. In an uncharacteristic scene, reminiscent of Yudhishthira's Pas complaining passivity and failure to act in defense of Draupadi, Rama lapses into a mood of fatalistic self-pity. So it falls up to the fiery Lakshmana to rally his brother, calling him out for appearing defenseless and exhorting him to action. The brief battle follows pretty much the Ramayana stock description of combat with one relevant detail not seen in the other such accounts of duels. Although pierced through by Rama with seven arrows, the Rakshasa undaunted continues to fight. It's only when each of the two princes breaks one of Virada's almost parodically gigantic arms that Virada, Bhagnabahu, his arms broken, falls mortally wounded. Next slide, please. And this is Rama and Lakshmana battling uh, Virada, who has carried off Sita, as you see. Uh, the punishment for sexual assault against a so-called parakia, that is a wife belonging to another man, is not only the threat of death, but some form of mutilation. In this case, the specifically highlighted breaking of Virada's immense arms appears to serve a similar function. Rama's great antagonist Ravana is arguably the most prolific serial sexual predator in world literature. His signature transgression is of course the abduction of the defenseless Sita in the absence of her husband and brother-in-law. Uh, slide, next slide, please. This is, however, by no means, uh, here's a scene of um, Ra Ravana carrying off Sita after mutilating and killing uh, the great bird, Jatayus, and you can see him on the upper right-hand corner flying away with, uh, since his chariot was smashed, he's flying away, and she, Sita, is dropping a little packet of jewelry onto a peak where some monkeys are gathered. That will be significant because they monkeys will bring them to Rama and Lakshmana who will recognize the jewelry. Uh, but you can do the next slide also. This is, but this is not by no means, uh, <laughs> this is a, a curious uh, slide from a uh, Belgian food company <laughs> who made cards for different world literature, this Libox, of all things, it's a bouillon, uh, which shows it uh, in, in the kind of European view of this. Um, uh, this is no means only, Ravana's only act of sexual predation as documented in the Sundar and Uttarakhandas of the poem. These range from abduction on what one might, one might call an industrial scale to outright rape, I will discuss some examples of this in a moment, but think for a moment about the figure of Ravana, he of the 10 heads, Dashagriva. What is the purpose of the poem's insistence on the Rakshasa Lord's extremely polymelic and polycephalic physiognomy? There's so many arms and so many heads. In plain English, why does he need 10 heads and 20 arms? In light of his pathological hypersexuality, I would suggest that those anomalies are indicators not only of Ravana's extraordinary physical strength and martial skill, but also his unmatched libidinal excess. In light of my previous examples, one would expect the punishment for his long history of transgressions against women, culminating in the abduction and captivity of Sita to similarly fit the magnitude of the crime. And this plays out quite literally when he receives his punishment in battle with Rama after a protracted, um, 
you can get the next slide up if you will, Manali. Go back and next one. Um, decapitation marks the end to many duels described in the poem and is one of the few wounds from which resilient epic warriors cannot <laughs> recover. Uh, and after a protracted duel with Ravana, the hero finally succeeds in beheading his foe. Decapitation marks the end to these duels. But in the case of Ravana, who appears to fight in his alternate two-armed form, single head and two-armed, each time Rama cuts off the Rakshas's head, can you put it in the slideshow view, please? Another head grows in its place. So in other words, the beheadings of Ravana, Ravana occur not just 10 times because of the 10 heads, but actually 100 times because he beheads him 100 times before uh, he receives a special arrow or uses a special astra, uh, which is uh, consecrated with mantras and discharges it, not at his head, but his chest. Pierced to the heart, the mighty Rakshas of Falls lifeless to the ground. You can see then Ravana fallen, all his heads around him. Uh, if, as I suggest, the proper punishment for adulterous sexual assault is some form of mutilation, possibly castration, a precedent set by the Rishi Gautama in the case of Indra, or by the removal or disfigurement of some other bodily appendage by way of replacement or substitution, then this curious incident of the multiple beheadings of Ravana and I might well speak to a sense of the hypertrophy of the Rakshasa Lord's libidinal energy and the excess of the punishment it merits. Um, the evidence for Rava's outsized sexual appetites is to be found in the Sundarakanda's lavish or description of the thousands of beautiful women of his inner apartments. These women, described in various levels of undress, are shown as asleep and intoxicated after nights of lovemaking with the Rakshasa Lord. They are said to be the daughters of royal seers, the Pittas, the Daityas, Gandharvas, and Rakshasas. The passage says they were all passionately in love with Ravana and that that mighty warrior had not, take, not taken a single one of them there by force. Rather, they had been won by his virtues. But these very same women in the Uttarakhanda are said to have been violently abducted after he slaughtered their male relatives. The 24th Sarga of that Khanda describes the abduction against their will of the women, married and unmarried, along with their grief of their slain fathers, for the slain fathers, fathers-in-law and brothers as children and mothers left behind. Such violent abductions of women would not be regarded as a crime in the Shastras, but for the fact that they are married, for the Rakshasa form of marriage is considered a normative form, as I said, uh, for marriage. So, as a king, Ravana was in his rights to forcibly abduct the unmarried women. But in the case of married women like Sita and Draupadi, the situation is different. So those women curse Ravana as followed. Sarvata sadrashtava vikramosya turatmanaha idam tu asasudharam karma paradara bimarshanam yasma isha parakyaso strishu rajyati durmatihi tasmat stri kritainaiva padam prapsiti ravanaha by all means, the valor of this evil-minded creature is quite appropriate, but the act that is unbecoming is the molestation of other men's wives. Since he is enamored of women who belong to others, he shall meet his death on the count of a woman. So that's his curse. The woman, of course, will be Sita. Um, Ravana then is suddenly drained of his virile energy, tatejaha, and completely stripped of his vital luster, as well as his sexual appeal and desire. Um, next slide, please. Ravana's large-scale uh, assault do not curtail his career as a sexual predation. I want to walk you through these quickly because they get to be, right, this, this is the abducted women cursing Ravana, which as a result of which he loses his desire to abduct uh, further women. But finally, Next slide, please. We see a series of violent assaults. This is his rape of the virtuous Brahmin woman, Vedavati, uh, whom he encounters in, in the forest uh, and assaults against her will. Next slide, please. This is his assault on the Apsaras, Ramba, who uh, was 
actually betrothed to his nephew, nephew uh, Nalakuvara, and she uh, curses him as well. Uh, that uh, he he will will suffer the consequences uh, for this. Um, but the, the um, obsession of the poet or the concern of the poet with rape is considerable. The next slide. This is something in the so-called prakshipta portions uh, of later portions of the uh, Ramayana, where in a previous e existence, Ravana actually has the temerity to assault the goddess Lakshmi. So he enters the palace of uh, Vishnu, who's asleep on the uh, divine serpent Sheshanaga, and tries to molest actually Lakshmi, of course, he then smashed to the ground by the force of uh, uh, Vishnu, who refuses to kill him because he says the time is not right because he's destined to be killed in a certain time in a simple certain place. And that is, uh, of course, uh, to be killed by uh, Ravana. Um, so one, one more slide of that sort. Uh, next, please. Since Valmiki is not finished with it, this is the rape of, uh, of uh, Araja, the daughter of the, the sage Shukracharya, by the foolish king Danda, which uh, results in a, a blight on his entire kingdom, destroyed by a huge dust storm. Finally, let me address very briefly a related anxiety about real or perceived sexual transgression in the epics. This is the current recurrent fear on the one hand, an erotic fantasy on the other, of men being turned into women. In other words, a complete emasculation. I've dealt with this theme elsewhere and will not go into the issue here, but I want to focus on one particular theme among these episodes, the theme of gen literal gender transformation brought about through accidental voyeuristic transgression. There are two relevant Rama uh, Ramayana tales of males who inadvertently wander into a grove where the divinities Shiva and Uma are making love and cast their eye on the erotized body of the goddess. As a result, they are transformed either through a curse or the emasculating property of the divine couple's trysting place. They either suffer a displaced castration or a literal one. The first occurs in the Uttarakhanda, where Kubera, performing austerities to propitiate Shiva, happens to come across the god and his wife in their erotic play. His left or sexualized eye falls upon the body of the goddess and her divine radiance burns it and blinds it. But pleased with his austerities, Shiva confers upon him the epithet Ekakshi Pingala, yellowed in one eye, memorializing this disability. Again, a form of mutilation. Even an accidental glance at a woman belonging to a powerful male can lead to a disability. Freud regarded this as blindness that had displaced castration coming to the end. Perhaps the most widely disseminated such story of emasculation as punishment is that of the King Illa. In the Uttarakhanda's version, Illa hunting with his retinue. Next slide, please. This is Shiva and Parvati, of course, uh, at ease in the forest. Next slide, please. And this is the King Illa going out on the left side of the screen with, on a grand hunting party with all of his troops and soldiers. And there he happens to transgress into the sacred area where Shiva and Parvati are uh, living. And everything in that area gets turned into a woman. Everything, except Shiva, of course, and Shiva's bull Nandi. So suddenly you see all the troops have turned into ladies, right? And uh, he, Ila tries to get the curse remitted. And finally, through the intervention of Parvati, they make a deal for him that he will become a woman every other month and become man in the interceding months, which is a very strange tale. This is the punishment for his transgression. And then in the Uttarakhanda's version, this is what happens. They're in the, near a mountain waterfall, Uma's lord, uh, and one eager to please the goddess had turned himself into a woman. Another extraordinary thing. Illa and his men are turned into women. And this is the result, that he will then have to remain a uh, woman 
every other month, during which, next slide please, he actually manages to become pregnant by the sage Buddha. So uh, a very strange uh, story, and that can only be caused uh, through an ashramada to remit the curse. So in conclusion, just briefly, let me say I have attempted and I hope perhaps succeeded in pointing out a rather un unstudied theme in the great Sanskrit epics, the theme of the crime of sexual assault and its punishment, which not only stands at the narrative and emotional heart of the poems, but runs through them in so overdetermined a fashion, repeated so many times as to suggest that it was and remains a source of both fascination and anxiety for the authors and audiences of these great monumental and fantastic works. Thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you, Professor Goldman, sir, for this very enlightening inaugural lecture, highlighting various aspects of women's lives as depicted in these scriptures. I now request Professor Bandopadhyaya to deliver the keynote address. Uh, sir, uh, you are on mute, sir. Professor Bandopadhyay, sir, you are on mute. Please unmute. Uh, Manali, you try whether you can unmute, sir. Uh, no, no, uh, I have, I can't, but I have asked him to unmute. Uh, there's an option to ask, but I can't unmute him myself. Okay. Uh, Manali, you can send him a text message. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. Chat box. Or you can send in the chat box. Yes. Uh, I have both sent him a message and put it in the chat box too. You can try calling him also. Maybe he's uh, not on the. Is he on the screen? Yes, he is on the screen. Uh, he, I can see him. Yeah. yeah. He is, uh, I think, speaking on the phone. Nandan sir must have called him. One second, I will also
very sorry for the delay. Able to unmute him. Oh. Manali, if computer is a problem, he can start speaking from the phone. Connecting the link. Okay, I will ask him that. I will ask him to join from the phone now. Just is it is it all right now? Yes, yes, sir. We are it's audible now. Okay. okay. Yes, sir. we can hear you. Okay. Anyway, so sorry for the delay. Devanam Hadra Shumati Rijiyatan Devanam Rati Rabinu Nivarjatan Ashram Pasayadi Mahavayam Devanayu Rati Ramti Jeevasi Ongayaya Marambha Shubhaya Bhavatu Ongayaya Marambha Shubhaya Bhavatu Ongayaya Marambha Shubhaya Bhavatu At this inaugural session, I am very happy to be with you all and I especially thank for the invitation to deliver the keynote address on this exceedingly interesting topic, uh, rewriting our story. In fact, uh, rewriting our story, what has been written? There has not been any comprehensive attempt ever for writing history of women in India. Chapters on women in this or that book, starting from P. V. Kanes, History of Dharma Shastra, or from the different chapters of the Vidhavavan series, or history of Bengal, or even comprehensive history of India, and down to position of women in ancient India by A. S. Altekar. All these books are written, but comprehensive history of women has not been attempted as yet. Only stray writings on one or the other aspect of the life of women, and that too of a particular period, ancient, medieval, or modern, has been done. So much has to be done, and that is why I say. Late us, I am Aram Vastubhaya Bhavatu. I am happy that this topic has been chosen and that in future we will see what are the different aspects for each aspect, whether that can be one sort of webinar like this, uh, over uh, spreading over seven days and to have opinion of different types of scholars how to do justice on this long pending subject. The subject is exceedingly interesting, as I said. I just give you, since I tell, told you that I have some other assignments and I, I should not have much time, I just give you two instances. What sort of writing is there? Rewriting, modification is absolutely essential. What is that? Number one, I quote one sloka, not from any text, the date of which is not definite. All in our Indian texts, the portion is using is maybe an in later interpolation as the Professor Goldman was pointing out, something Prokshipta was, he was referring. On the other hand, we do not know the date of that particular Prokship. So that is one, that is why we, are, we should better depend on the concrete evidence of epigraphy on which in, in most of which the date is there or it is fairly well datable. I refer one instance that is from the Junagar inscription of Skandagupta. It is Skandagupta was a king of the Gupta period, everybody knows, and he of the fifth century AD. So in this inscription, there is a very interesting line. Uh, now, interesting line saying that a grown up girl applying her mind, selected on her own, her own husband, not among the invitees of the father, as it happens in Sayambara form of marriage. No. So, Karmena Vidya Nikonam Padhariya, Yatha Chakrishna Nikonam Dosa Hekun, Apit Shadban Mundyanjur Putran, Lakshmi Sayam Nijam Navayan Chakar. Goddess selecting a man, human being, as husband, 
it is it is not beyond comprehension because in the gupta period already the, the kings were deified the kings are described as achintya purusha or lokodhamna devo now if a girl is to be married as is the general belief and written in the books the girl seems to be given in marriage very early 5 6 7 8 9 10 12 years within 12 years so they did not have any education they did not learn anything and that is why the old position of women nobody takes interest in writing sorry in fact when it is saying that kamena buddha nipunam padaryo nipun buddhi sharp intellect applying can a girl of 5 6 7 8 10 12 do it no that is why she was matured enough grown up enough to select her husband after properly analyzing the merits and demerits in a bank and that is concrete that for the concrete evidence of that is this you know the story now one more shloka i refer to see there is the general saying that in ancient india or even in india women has no liberty and the of course a passage from the narada smriti is quoted pita rakshati kaumare bhatta rakshati jovane putra rakshati vardhakye na sri satantam varhati sorry satantram has been translated deliberately motivated translation saying that no liberty no 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 a physical seclusion of 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 women is not desirable that is what is that is why it is said pitarakshati kaumare in the childhood days the father protects the child woman child and girl child similarly bhakta rakshati jo bole the husband protects during the years and adhakki putra rakshati son protects at time at the age at the right place at the old age so this three satantram is actually seclusion not liberty liberty to translate that means that is poor knowledge because you see it is is difficult to grasp the exact meaning of particular uh, word used by the poet one has to be conversant with the culture then only he can do it just as i give an example of the famous uh, french scholar of uh, on indian inscriptions he translated you see murta not is always in the sense of death it is, it is death death be or nearing to death and all these things are there anyway i am not going to into that the point i am referring is that the idea that liberty was not there for women in ancient india is not correct it is it is only that particular verse is everywhere quoted you read any book on uh, position of women in india and you will find this quoted and showing that this is the pathetic position of women no physical protection is always necessary that is what is emphasized wrongly it has been interpreted in that way and in our presidential lecture of the epigraphical society of india delivered at bangalore uh, 1900 i'm sorry 2002 there i pointed out that this sort of thing in the epigraphs concrete dated epigraphs there are many details which has to be correlated with literary evidence if somebody has to use literary evidence otherwise just from a story or this or that story this happened that happened that happened meaningless and that sort of writing is no good for us what is necessary is to write a comprehensive history acceptable or depended depend depended on depending on primary source of information like inscriptions and coins you are saying i am saying coins yes there is there is inscription there are inscriptions on coins also and there also you can get much material all these things are not taken so much importance so i was i told you that i i would be taking not more than 10 15 minutes 15 minutes are already over so i am sorry that i cannot spend more time i would have been happy but i shall be attending the afternoon classes now the selection committee meeting is going on for indian administrative service and i shall have to be there right from 11 o'clock so i take leave of you with the very best wishes for the seminar 
very best places for the organizers. And that with the saying again, Om Arambhav Shubhaya Bhavatu. Om Shanti, Om Shanti, Om Shanti. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Bandupadeh, sir, for your inspiring keynote address. Uh, over to our honorary president, uh, Sri Nandan Shastri, sir, for the presidential remarks. Respected Professor Robert, uh, Professor Samresh Ji, uh, many renowned scholars of the History Enthusiast Group, dear President Manali, Vice President Nidhi. The History Enthusiast Group has formed a community of over 800 members across Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and YouTube. Now it has entered for first time on Zoom platform from today's virtual event of inaugural function. At the outset, I want to recapitulate having met in person uh, Dr. Uh, Goldman through Professor Padmanabh Jaini, who was born in coastal Karnataka in 1923. As I was associated both with Lawrence Hall of Science, Berkeley, and Asian Art Museum, San Francisco, I was very fortunate to meet both Professor Robert and his wife, uh, Dr. Sally, often. Professor Robert is a captious uh, thinker whose interest in religion extend beyond India in South and Southeast Asia. In today's uh, presentation, he has argued that through these representations of uh, gender and sexuality, the Sanskrit epics, both Ramayana and Mahabharata, register deeply rooted attitudes about these critical issues and serve as vehicles for the dissemination of the concepts of gender normality uh, that continue to affect thinking and practice in South Asian society. Today, he has shown 24 slides on sexual assault and anxiety of gender, the epic Rushis and their audience confront uh, the problematics of gender difference and the human sexuality. Professor Samresh Bandopadhyay's outstanding contribution is in different aspects of Indology, like literature, numismatics, epigraphy, architecture, iconography, uh, sculptures, uh, etc. In his uh, a brief presentation, uh, he uh, drew our attention regarding concrete evidence of epigraphy. He mentioned uh, Junagadh inscription, uh, that is a, and he said uh, that it is a very wrong notion that women had no liberty in ancient period. Of course, uh, her physical liberty uh, uh, was confined in childhood. Her father protects her in married life, her husband protects, and when she becomes a widow, her son protects her. Pavras uh, Samresh uh, is a very uh, knowledgeable guy, but uh, due to lack of time, uh, he has delivered a very brief note. And I wish the remaining uh, events of our Itihas Sapta, I guess about uh, over 27 speakers uh, to follow uh, from afternoon today uh, till uh, May 19th. Uh, I wish uh, all the best uh, for our uh, events, virtual events. Thank you very much. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you, Nandan, sir. I now request to propose the vote of thanks uh, to Ms. Manali Momaya, President of the History Enthusiast Association. Thank you very much, Nadi. Uh, I still cannot believe that uh, we have come, we have already begun the international webinar 
and uh, we have almost completed the inaugural session. Uh, it was yesterday that we were all uh, uh, worried and nervous, uh, especially myself and Nidhi, because uh, we are doing such a thing for the first time. And uh, as you can see, uh, both of us are uh, really very young, inexperienced research scholars. Uh, but with the support of all our elders, uh, the inaugural session, maybe with some glitches, uh, has completed successfully. So uh, I do want to thank, um, I'm extremely thankful to Professor Goldman uh, for taking out valuable time from his very busy schedule uh, to share his knowledge with us. Uh, sir, your command on the Indian epics and your deep understanding of ancient Indian society and uh, religion uh, and uh, mythology and literature are all inspiring. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I also thank uh, Professor Bandopadhyay, sir, for directing us to re-examine and reinterpret the epigraphical sources uh, in order to reconstruct her story. Uh, definitely, epigraph, uh, epigraphs hold a very, very valuable place uh, in the reconstruction of history, and uh, uh, we will definitely take your advice. Uh, sir has also taken out time from a very, very hectic schedule. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for joining us. Uh, next, I want to thank our Honorable President, uh, Sri Nandan Shastri, sir, uh, in every uh, step of this webinar, its uh, organization, uh, sir has guided us constantly and uh, his experience and his expertise. Uh, he is a museum expert and uh, he knows how to organize the artifacts. And so he also knows how to organize events. And uh, that has helped us a lot. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, I also thank all the senior professors who have joined us today. Professor Uma Chakravarti uh, has joined us uh, in this uh, uh, meeting. Uh, Professor Rekha Pandey has also joined us. Uh, and all other uh, senior professors whose names I might have forgotten to say here, but uh, uh, thank you all for joining us today. And uh, uh, all the advisory members of the History Enthusiast, uh, all the students, scholars who have uh, attended the inaugural session and who will attend the uh, upcoming sessions of the webinar. Uh, last but not the least, I want to thank uh, my friend, uh, Ms. Nidhi Katti, Vice President of the History Enthusiast for moderating this uh, session very successfully. Uh, thank you all. Uh, we will meet again in the evening uh, for our next session. Uh, that is by uh, Professor Gauri Parimukrishnan. Uh, it is a very interesting lecture and the link uh, will be posted in the WhatsApp group as well as on your emails. Uh, please check it out. Thank you so much. Much Thank you. Uh, Yes, I have ended the live stream and will be ending the meeting. Thank you all. I'm ending the meeting here. Uh, we shall all meet in the evening. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs>